All right, welcome back to the Celtics Lab podcast. I'm your host, Cameron Tepetabai. I'm joined by Dr. Justin Quinn and Alex Goldberg. It is the postseason. We have got Celtics Nets, and to break it all down, we bring in the legendary Steve Bolpet of Heavy.com. Steve, how are you? Living the dream, like I told you guys. Yeah. Uh, Steve, you're here to talk to us about everything from Ben Simmons and Robert Williams to ducking opponents in the postseason to how far these Celtics can go. And let's start with um, the news of the day. It's Thursday evening at this point. We found out today that perhaps Ben Simmons could be back as soon as game four. Um, let's assume that the reporting is good. What do you think that means for the Nets? Is, is that a good call or are they rushing this uh, from your point of view, Steve? Well, you know, having not seen his medicals, it's hard to know whether he's, you know, rushing it or not. But if he is healthy, he does come back. That gives him uh, help on defense, which is if you look at the Nets and say, what do they need help in? That would be the spot. Sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, assuming he's OK, um, you know, it's hard to see him getting up to speed um, in terms of just cohesiveness with the rest of the guys offensively. but you know, um, they don't need him offensively, really. You know, they just need need him to defend and, uh, you know, uh, make someone think twice, which I'm not sure the defense they have right now, if the Celtics play the way they're supposed to, I don't think the Nets can do that right now. Yeah, is there anything you saw out of that, and it's just one game, that Nets-Cavs game that you think this is why they're bringing Ben Simmons back as soon as possible, or do you think they were going to do it anyways? Well, I think they were going to do it anyway if, if they had the opportunity, you know. Um, the worst thing that could happen is they bring him back too soon and he suffers an injury that's, that's you know, worse, more debilitating. So, you know, um, as much as they want to win right now, they can't, you know, uh, Ben Simmons, the way he's approached things, wouldn't let them. Uh, he's right. not like, you know, Mr. Blood and Guts by any means. So, um, you know, I... I think they saw that, yeah, they need some, some good on the ball defense. And, um, you know, he's the kind of guy that can, that can pull that off. Um, again, when healthy, he hasn't, you know, done as much as you would expect of him so far in terms of what I'm hearing about his, what he's been doing for workouts. So, um, you know, it's hard to see, uh, him coming back and being, ultra effective, but again, having not seen his medicals and not being there in person to see how he's moving, cutting, et cetera, you know, we really don't know. Sure. Yeah. We, in a previous iteration of the podcast kind of wondered if yeah, mentally he was ready to come back, but that's not really our lane to, to explore. So, Hey, let's hope he's healthy and let's hope the, the, the series is, is not detrimental to anyone. Uh, and speaking of which, the Celtics have their own player that it's not really clear when they may or may not come back. The latest on Rob Williams, uh, we heard from Coach Udoka today at practice. He said that Rob is doing non-contact basketball drills. He's getting shots up. Um, and I quote, it's low level, but he's ramping it up day by day and feeling good about it. Steve, anything you've heard from the Rob camp that makes you think he's going to be back for round one? Or do you think it's more likely that he's back round two or beyond? Well, what we heard at the start was four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. What I heard subsequently is that lower end of that. Um, and so if you look at it four weeks, you know, you can see that he could come back during this series. If this series is still going on at that point, let's sure. put that part in there. Um, and, you know, obviously you're looking at it saying, you know, that, that if he comes back, that there's, there would be no setback between now and then as he, as you say, ramps up his, uh, his activities. So, um, yeah, you know, um, um, everyone's looking forward to seeing how that works. Um, but, uh, by all accounts so far, it wasn't a, a major surgery having, you know, having had a number of, uh, you know, surgeries on myself here, uh, <laughs> let's remember the old line minor surgeries, what they do to other people. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, you know, it should be something he could come back from if, if what we're hearing is correct and he could come back soon. Um, but if you are, if you're up three Oh in the series and he's okay to come back game four, do you bring him back for game four? You know, um, you know, wisdom here is, is 
is going to rule the day, you know, with regard to a, how he's doing, how healthy he is and B, you know, um, which way to go with this as far as where you are in a series and where you are schedule wise. And can you buy him a few more days of preparation? I'm going to ask a follow-up question that I don't know if it has an answer yet. As best you can tell, we have a new front office and a new coaching staff. Do you think the team's relationship with their medical staff has changed at all with these two kind of dual regime changes or is it too, too soon to know? No, there hasn't been. I, the, the change came a few years ago when they, sure. they chose to go in a different direction, a little more, um, you know, a, a, away from the, what we've come to know as traditional and more toward um, maintenance, not just maintenance, but, uh, you know, uh, better preparation, um, using more aspects of science. Not that the previous, uh, the previous medical staff was, was not using leeches. Um, right. and you know, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, more of the stuff, the, you know, the, um, the, the newer techniques and, and a lot. Um, they kind of went in that direction and I, that's where they are now. Sure. Uh, I don't know if you're on Snapchat, but Jason Tatum posted a picture of the most unhealthy chicken wings I think I've ever seen. Um, so he hasn't adopted the Chris Paul vegan diet yet, but oh, it's, chicken it's wing, that, That's my thing, dude. Uh, I got an air fryer last year and, uh, chicken wings at least once a week, oh, all right. uh, Cajun spices, and then some Montreal spicy, okay. um, Steve, Are you going to have to send me this over there? I am the Lord of the Wings. <laughs> <laughs> Lord of the Wings, I love that. Uh, are you in Boston? Do you have a favorite place for wings in Boston? Uh, home, my home. Okay, yeah. the Bullpit yeah. House. All right, cool. Well, uh, we'll have to get that recipe uh, from you offline. I just gave it to you. <laughs> That's it. That's the recipe right there. Yeah. And now I have to kill you. Sorry. Okay, well, it's fair. Well, let me try the wings first, at least. Um, okay, a few more things, then we'll get into the meat and potatoes of the series itself. Going into last week, the Celtics had an opportunity to sit their guys and they could have ducked the nets, uh, which a lot of people have spilled some ink saying it was foolish not to. You've been around the block. Do you think there's any justification for ducking an opponent, an opponent so opening openly like maybe the Bucks did? Or do you think what the Celtics did is the right move? Well, I think what they did, I think, well, first of all, when it got to Sunday, I don't know if you guys, did you read what I, uh, what got posted today, my story? Uh, I'm just going to tell you I haven't yet, no. It's, it's free. I've been teaching all day. <laughs> I bookmarked the video on Twitter, though. Video? Yeah, you got it. Well, anyway, uh, this, anyway so uh, for you bums who didn't, you know, take the time to read a free story, no paywall. Heavy.com, um, everyone. Check it out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, the, the, the basis of it is this. When it got to Sunday night, the choice, you know, they, everyone said the best the idea would be to be the number three seed and play Chicago. Mm -hmm. That wasn't on the table when it got to Sunday night because the Bucs had lost and Philly was going to beat uh, Detroit even without uh, Embiid uh, and Harden. Uh, so your choice was second seed or fourth seed go against Toronto and potentially bring in a vaccination issue. Sure. like Philadelphia is happening potentially. So, yeah. Um, and I think, okay, let's take a step back. I think it was, I think it would be dumb anyway to try to, you know, gain the system as I wrote, you know, you, you play your guys. And if you hadn't played your guys, you're looking at, at uh, what a week and a half away from game action for those people. Mm -hmm. You know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and, Number one, you're playing, you know, um, again, I'll direct you to the story. I, my point was that the, 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 the Nets can't beat the Celtics. They don't, they're not capable of beating the Celtics. All right. The Celtics can lose the series. If the Celtics go back to playing the way they did earlier in the year, ball sticking, um, playing individualistic, not playing the kind of defense they have, they can lose the series. But the Nets would need help from the Celtics to win the series. So you go into this saying, and to me, and I think I tweeted this last week, if you can't beat the team with the 20th ranked defense, then what are you doing here anyway? You know, I mean, it just yeah. it, it doesn't make sense to me that you would try to duck even 
granting the the ridiculous talent that is uh, Kevin Durant and for whatever else you think about him, Kyrie Irving is a re- incredibly wonderful basketball player. Mm-hmm. You know, and he's like he can be unguardable, and he's got handles, and he can shoot, and he can go off. But uh, your defense should be well equipped to, you know, with switches, etc., to keep those guys from from getting, you know, too crazy. Uh, but even if they do, you should be able to score uh, well enough to win a shootout as long as you move the ball and cut. I should we all should say cut first because. You know, you have to cut to be open. So we always say ball movement. What what we mean really is, you know, player movement. Player movement that creates the ball movement that gets the defense out of position and gets you layups, etc. Uh, so we're gonna pivot and, and really get into the series. And I want to do a sponsor break, but just because you brought it up, what does Derek White mean to that ball movement mentality or that player movement mentality? He's just a guy who absolutely fits. Um, you know, when, when the trade happened, I'm not sure if I wrote or, t- or tweeted or whatever, but it was a high price to pay. I thought the first round pick and the pick swap coming up, you mm-hmm. know, I thought that was really high, but as I put, as I wrote, if he's the guy you wanted, if he's the guy they identified, then by all means go for it. You know, it's, it's, it's your thing. It's your, it's your club. If that's the move you think is right, then even though you're, quote unquote overspending, you're really not. Yeah. You know what I mean, if it gets you what you need, if it gets you a guy who fits really well into what you want to do, then you know, the price is worth it. Cool. Uh, I very inclined to agree. And uh free memoir title, I'm not sure if I wrote it or tweeted it. Uh you can have that. We're in the Celtics lab portion of the programming. Mr. Bullpet, let me ask you this. Boston has home court We'll get into the VAC stuff maybe briefly, but how much does home court matter to these Celtics? Well, that was the second part of the why you want the number two seed is if you're going to win this first series and play as you expect Milwaukee in the second round series, you know, how much happier are you to have home court than you would be to have to go to Milwaukee for a four out of seven potentially? You know, that could be huge. So, uh, yeah, it, it takes one game to win another team's home court to turn that around. But still, you know, and, and, and again, home court is no guarantee, but you'd, you'd much rather have it than not have it. Yeah, and I feel like we, we love to talk about the, the fans, and I do think the Garden fans, I mean, I think that's why Al Horford signed here in part. Um, but just sleeping in your own bed <clears throat> makes a huge difference too. So the, the comfort that comes with home, I think we sometimes overlook um, Steve, let's just do it quickly. If the Celtics end up playing Toronto, do you think that the vaccine stuff is going to come into play or are you less convinced? At this moment, I think it would. If they were, if they were playing Toronto, to, if all of a sudden the NBA said, oh, we messed up the math, you're playing Toronto on Sunday, mm-hmm. it would matter. Um, as best you can tell, do you think that the team is trying to rectify that in case they play Toronto or... If they're going to play Toronto, it's going to be an issue. Um, how much can I say? Um, sure. Uh, you can say no comment. No, well, I mean, trying to think of, you know, yeah, I, I'm trying to uh, protect, um, trying to give you the, the, what I know and what I can, what I can state clearly. Sure, of um, course. Uh, yeah, from everything I've heard, um, it's something that they were rectified. They were in the process of rectifying. and. You know, um, the fact that all of a sudden Toronto is off the table has kind of put things on hold. And that's not a major issue, I don't think. Um, but, yeah, um, you know, I, I think it's something that's certainly in their thinking. And uh, if it's ever a, if it becomes a possibility, then, you know, I think there'd be some planning, et cetera, that would go that would happen. That was so incredibly diplomatic. That's why you're the best in the biz. <laughs> well, it's, it's you know, you know, you've got sources and you've got certain things you can, yeah. But you want to tell people. I mean, I wish I could tell you everything. Wish I could tell you every source that I have um, 
And when I put in a story that, you know, a certain league executive said this or said that, I wish I could tell you because it would make my life a lot easier because people would then go, oh, yeah, we definitely believe him now. Uh, but that's just not the way it works. You have to protect. Some people are telling you things where if you knew their name, if I were to publish their name, they could and most likely would lose a job. Sure. So you, you've got to be, you know, my job is to try to get people as much information as I can. Uh, and, you know, uh, and to get that, you sometimes have to say, okay, you can use this informationally, but you can't uh, attribute the quote, et cetera. So, um, you know, you, I guess it might come across as weaselly to some people out there. And, you know, by all means, you're, you're entitled to, they're entitled to think that way. But it's really about, you know, what can I, as much as I can tell you that you'd want to know. I wanted to ask you a little bit about, now it seemed like you were also referencing the uh, the controversy that was from in part you were reporting, there were other people who were hinting at the possibility of splitting up the Jays earlier in the season. Uh, I know you probably had a lot of people trying to dunk on you, not understanding what you just described for us, but in cases like that, it seems, you know, like, the informational aspect of it is more important than, for example, in this case of the vaccine situation, where you also have to consider things like public health and like interpersonal relationships in that person's circle in ways that maybe are magnified a level above the normal NBA reporting. And I'm just curious, like, what is it like trying to operate with those additional pressures? Like, how do you think about your reporting? Like, how does how does that work for you? Well, you know, you, you go to the basic thing of, you know, you're trying to find out as much as you can, right? Um, <clears throat> I, I go back to my college and teach for a week every year. And the basic points you're trying to get across to, to journalism students, and it's a, not just sports writing, it's general journalism, but in sports writing in particular, you know, take the reader some, tell them something they don't know, or take them someplace they can't be, right? So, you know, um, you can be writing about the machinations of a trade as it's going on, you know, and some people will say, just tell me when it's over. But it's like some people like to know the as step by step process, even though it could change tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and you can write something that so and so is thinking this, even though they would never want to say that publicly. Uh, and that and even and when you report it, they're going to say this is crazy, even though you know it's true and they know it's true. But, um, you know, I've been doing this a long time and like I grew up in the Boston area as a sports fan. Um, so I'm writing for people like that. I'm writing for people that you know, give a damn about this stuff. Um, and, you know, I'm held to that standard by certainly by readers who keep you on your toes. And, you know, I still hang out with guys I played a little league with. If I were being a jerk or, or if I was just, you know, throwing things against a wall, um, I'd be catching hell from them. And that'd be a hell of a lot worse for me to have to deal with than, you know, uh, someone who gets unhappy because I wrote something that they'd rather not have known. I don't know if that explains it entirely, but um, it's it's not as hard as it, as it would think. It's not really a, there aren't any real huge ethical um, uh, hurdles to deal with here. It's, you know, giving you as much information as I can and help you enjoy the games or know as much as you can. So when you're in an argument at a bar, you know, um, you can pull out that card. Yeah. Sure. Well, See, this, I, this I, is I, the I kind of card. You, you, know, I thought about myself. you know, <laughs> <laughs> this is the kind of hard hitting advice that we need on this podcast. This is why we have you on here. Thanks a lot for coming on. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you one, other, one quick story that I can tell now. Um, uh, a bunch of years ago, remember the, the Celtics were trying to get Kevin Love mm -hmm. and, um, and it was being reported that, Oh, they have the most they can give they're going to get Kevin Love. This is going to happen. And they were like national people saying this and people on the radio were saying this. And a buddy of mine and, and I had been out and um, we, it was like uh, later that night, we stopped off to have a, a, a pizza and a beer. And he was telling me during the ride, you know, he goes, you know, they're killing you on radio saying, because I'm just saying, look, it's not going to happen. The Celtics aren't going to get, aren't going to trade for Kevin Love. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, I go, they're killing you. They're, they're killing you on the radio and the, and the, about this, saying you don't know what you're talking about. I said, well, you know, trust me, I'm, I'm good on this. And so anyway, we're there and we're having our second beer and the, the phone uh, rings and it's, I, I show them, I show him the name on the phone. It was Flip Saunders. I go, but here's why I know they're not going to get Kevin Love. <laughs> Because Flip had been telling me, look, I, I've got more, I've got a better offer elsewhere, and it's not going to be Boston. And, you know, I've known Flip for a bunch of years. I couldn't say that at the time that, you know, sure. Flip Saunders says this offer isn't as good as he can get elsewhere. But I can just tell you, you know, if you're a Celtic fan, don't pay attention to this because it's not going to happen. So, you know, there's a thing where you've got to protect the source, but you know, and I can at least, if you're a Celtic fan and you're, getting your hopes up for Kevin Love, I can tell you, don't do that because I don't want to see you disappointed and get angry and throw things and maybe break your TV and cost you a bunch of, cost yourself a bunch of money because I want to save you money. Well, yeah. yeah, Steve, and this is so inside baseball or I suppose inside basketball, but uh, Alex and I are high school teachers by, by trade. So I can hear what like teenagers think about the happenstances in the NBA and the kind of aggregate trickle down economy of Steve Bulbet writes in heavy.com this, and then it gets aggregated by such and such a website. And then it gets tweeted out. And then some teenager is walking around so convinced that Jalen Brown is going to be traded in the next 48 hours. And uh, the world turns. I mean, Jalen Brown knows he can sleep at night. You know, you can sleep at night. It's fine that the teenager thinks something dumb, but well, the, interesting. in that story, I tried to point out that they were, you know, how that came, how that came about was sure. usually I'll know when it's, when a guy is potentially going to be traded because, you know, doing it a long time, you, you know, these guys as players and then they start running teams and, you know, you keep up that relationship, you know, that business relationship where you're talking all the time. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden I start hearing from teams saying, you know, and obviously they know about Jalen Brown as a basketball player. But you'll get a call saying, what kind of guy is he away from the court? How does he deal with media? You know, personality wise, how is he in the, in the dressing room with guys, you know, with his teammates, things like that. And so you start getting a couple of those calls and it's like, you know, their teams were convinced that Jalen Brown could be available at the end of the season. And they wanted Jalen Brown. So they were thinking they wanted to know as much as they sure. could to potentially put in a bid for him before the trade deadline. So that's where the stuff, that's where it started. And then you find out, okay, well, how are they thinking this? And then I found out how they were thinking that. And it's like, okay, there's been a bunch of unhappiness going around here. And, you know, there was a ton, I can tell you there was a ton of frustration around that team. And, um, you know, that's where maybe someone said things out of frustration or whatever, But that word got to teams out there and they were really, you know, sniffing around on the scent of because, you know, of of Jalen Brown, because people think he's an is an attractive player. And they were, you know, how can we how could we get him? Because there any way we could put together a a package that would pry him away from the Celtics now. Um, But as I also mentioned that, you know, the first choice was to keep this together and make it work out. Mm-hmm. But as you watched this team be a 500 team last year, and as you watched it stumble through the early part of this season, I, I can imagine you guys were having you know, a lot less pleasant podcasts <laughs> than you are now uh, about this stuff. So yeah, you know that's where that's where it happened. And had they continued to have these kind of problems, yeah, no question in my mind that this would be a huge issue coming into. Uh, the off season, which if they continue to play the way that they had, you know, might have already begun for them at this point. So I'm going to, I'm going to use that as a segue for a, a question about this Celtics team. I have one more about just the coverage of the game while you're here. Do you think that the NBA will go back to uh, media members in the locker room? And do you think that if they don't, that would be a mistake? Um. Interesting you asked. Uh, I'm still a vice president of the PBWA, the Writers Association. All right. And we have had, we're, excuse me, we've been having meetings with the league 
ongoing anyway, just about access and um, you know how to improve things, even during the time where the question of the of the locker room was not even on the table. And now it is, mm-hmm. and we're talking, and we're working toward, we're trying to work toward that. Um, you know, we'll see where I can tell you that they've been really good conversations, but, you know, um, and, and as you'd expect, I'm not telling you anything that you, sure. you know, wouldn't have already figured was going on. Um, but, you know, um, it's, it's being talked about and, um, you know, we'll see where it goes. Yeah. Th- again, if this is an off season topic, I can understand the player's, uh, hesitation, but I can also understand how it would fundamentally change how the game is covered. But uh, yeah, there's, there's a, there's a, you know, yeah, there's a lot of ways to look at it and, and look at the locker room situation and the difference between where it is now to where it was or where it can be. There are ways, the way it is now, there are situations where what's going on now doesn't benefit players. Right. You know, um, in terms of being able to have discussions uh, and to answer questions that aren't in front of everybody. Mm -hmm. There's times you want to ask a guy something to the side and it's important that you ask it to the side. And that's where, you know, that's where the work gets done is when you can talk to somebody away from the, and even just, you know, building those kind of relationships, right. You know, to that, that allow you to, to not just break stories, but tell stories. You know, I've got a bunch of examples and, you know, over the time I've been doing it where, you know, something more important than telling you the basketball score, a story has come out that was more important than just the sport because you've developed the relationship, the working relationship with somebody and the trust and accountability going both ways is, is built. Yeah. And I would just hazard, I mean, I uh, was in the locker room a little bit with Celtics hub and nowadays, to get that kind of access uh, from maybe not the premier source for Celtics content, it would just be next to impossible. So if you're not coming from ESPN or you're not grandfathered in the system, making those relationships, to your point, would be uh, fundamentally impossible, I suppose. I don't know. Yeah, well, Anyways, I, well as far as the grandfathering, I, I don't think if the locker room opens and I am one of the people that has access, it wouldn't be because I'm grandfathered. And I wouldn't accept that. Sure. Because- if I'm let in because of that, then I'm taking someone else's space and that ain't happening. I, if I'm in there, it means that uh, people have looked at heavy.com's metrics and what the coverage, what our reach is, how, you know, um, how we get to people and uh, how many people are following us that makes it, you know, worthwhile. This isn't a, it's not a, um, it, a, a, uh, First Amendment uh, situation here. Yeah. This is a private business, the NBA, and it can choose um, how it chooses, how it wants to set things up. So, um, yeah, if I'm in the dressing room, it would mean that heavy.com has earned its way in because the NBA has looked at our metrics and say, okay, this is a, a, a site that gives us a better reach than some of the other sites that you might think would be more traditional sites, even. Sure. No, absolutely. Um, so let's let's get back to the series itself. Uh, but I, again, this I could do this for hours. This is incredible peek behind the curtain. Um, I'm going to give you a few players, and from that player's team's perspective, give me your level of injury concern. One being no concern. Ten being if I'm the team, I'm kind of freaking out. So uh, level of injury concern for Tatum and that uh, knee tendinopathy. Um, not much concern. I mean, you know, obviously maintenance but um i don't think there's a i don't think there's a huge level of concern that he's going to have to miss games you know sure. especially playoff times is there's no back to backs and in fact you know uh the first uh few games in the series you're going to have two days between the first and second and second and third so you know there should be opportunity there to to be prepared uh, same question with Horford and his lingering back issue. I think it's similar, you know. Um, I think he's done a tremendous job. And, I, and you know, it's funny because with uh, with the rise of Tatum, how he's made himself a more complete player. And then, and then some people will just look at the numbers, the scoring numbers, and go, wow. But with all the things the Celtics have done, 
this season and turning things around. Horford kind of gets overlooked. But if you look at, at even at the metrics um, and you suss them out, he's he's in the middle of all that stuff. Yeah. You know, uh, his, you know, his metrics are his analytics are you know, off the off the table. Like, wow. And and then you just look at it with you know the eye test. Horford being able to to hand to man the middle has helped make Rob Williams the defensive, you know, Goliath that he has become. Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't tell Bruce Brown that, huh? Um, all right, if you're the Nets, what's your level of concern for uh, Seth Curry's ankle? I'd be a little bit worried, but, you know, again, because of the, the scheduling and how, how the playoff games get scheduled, they should be able to keep, you know, uh, keep control of that, I would think. And um, finally, he's coming back from COVID, so it's not a traditional injury, but he hasn't really had time to uh, build himself kind of into the Nets fabric. Level of concern that Goran Dragic can be a player who was a reliable piece. Um, guys like Goran Dragic, I, I, I think those guys are you know they're just they're gamers, you know, and um, you know he'll find a way to contribute, and he's a guy that would concern me. You know, what I mean, I, you, yeah. you know, yeah, you should be able to deal with him. You should be able to. Um, beat him uh, when he's on defense, but he's a guy that's going to get his hand in and knock a ball away. And, um, you know, um, the other night he uh, got his hand in and, and knocked two balls away. Mm-hmm. I mean, least of which he's tough as nails. All the play I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, our guy, Marcus Smart, sometimes uh, achieves similar stuff, either with his hand or his foot. So I'm going to bite my tongue a little bit. All right, let's look at the offense, Mr. Volpet. The Celtics ranked ninth in offense this season, the Nets 10th, but since the All-Star break, the Celtics were number one in offensive rating and the Nets were number seven in offensive rating. That said, the Nets do employ Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. Who do you think has the offensive edge and why for this series? If the Celtics play the way they have, first of all, I don't really go by the by the numbers, you know, because it, Sure. You can say, okay, that'll, that'll tell you a larger story. But in terms of translating it to right now, you got to look at the matchup. You got to look at, at, you know, how the teams match up with each other. Because the what you're talking about with their ratings since, you know, the, since January 6th or whatever, since that loss to the, to the Knicks, that's played against a wide variety of teams. Some good, some really bad. Mm-hmm. Like right now, how are they going to do in this series against what they have to face? And like I wrote, um, if the way if they play the way there's that they have been playing the movement etc then they're going to score against anybody so you know um and if the you know and whereas the the uh the nets have kevin durant who's unguardable okay you know hi i'm kevin durant i'm going to take the ball and i'm going to shoot it and i'm going to score and it's not a damn thing you can do about it he gets to say that and he can be right um but um you know uh, I think overall the Celtics can, you know, should be able to put enough of a, of a jog into the, the Nets offense that uh, it won't be operating at, at top speed perhaps. So let's look at the other side of the ball. I'm not going to, I mean, even with defensive rating, notwithstanding it's a non-contest, but can the Celtics win this on the strength of their defense or do they also need to pony up on offense? Oh, they're going to need to to do their offense, obviously, you know, but, um, you know, it's, I'll go back to it. It, This, this, for the, for the Celtics to lose to, to not win this series, they're going to have to go away from things that they've been doing. And they're not necessarily, it's not necessarily the nets taking them away from those things. It's if they don't come out with the proper defensive mindset, aggressiveness, um, you know, getting into guys, uh, if they don't come out with that kind of a mentality, then, you know, and they they find themselves on their heels a little bit, the Nets could take advantage of that. The Nets could, Nets could win this series, but again, sure. they're going to, it would need the Celtics help. And so, you know, as I, I ended the story basically is, is the Celtics faded. It's like, it's in their hands, you know, it's, it's, it's not out of their control at this time of the year. You know, you can't really ask for much more than that. 
You know, if you do your stuff, you can win. You will win. You know, you can say that this series. If they go on to face the Bucks, you know, it may be more of a question. It would be more of a question. But right now, you know, um, the Celts would need to to blunder um, and to, you know, um, have a basketball mind injury to to falter here. So to that end, I have said a few times on this podcast, I, the Celtics still skew young, even with, you know, Al Horford and an, an older Marcus Smart. What are you looking for out of the coaching staff in this series, given everything that we've established? I think they've pretty well set the table, don't you? I mean, um, you know, I think there were times during the early part of the year where they were um, – a little reticent to go with certain people. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that um, their comfort level is greater now. So that if you, that, you know, if um, you, they put Peyton Pritchard in the game and he misses his first three trays that you don't just yank him that, okay, you know, you trust him because that's Mm -hmm. what's most important for a shooter, right? Is having the trust um, and having a clear mind to shoot. Um, So, yeah, I, I, you know, I think just trusting what the, I think that the coaching staff trusts in what they've done and, you know, just like keeps an eye to make sure that the, you know, that the Celtics on the floor color within the lines, you know, that they've established, I think they'll be fine. What about on the other end? Uh, I've heard some observations that there really isn't much in the way of adjustments for the Nets to make It's either Kyrie and, uh, Kevin come out and just just dominate or there really isn't anything to do. I mean, is that true? Is, is there something that Nash would be able to do that you can think of? I mean, are they just kind of penciled into either, either they hit their shots and they win or they don't. Well, I think the the, the bigger part with that is um, yeah, you're going to want the ball in the hands of Kyrie and Durant as much as possible, but how are you getting the ball into their hands and where are they getting the ball into their hands? Um, you know, are they running off picks first? Are they just starting out top and, you know, and making a series of moves and, um, they've got to figure out how the Celtics are going to defend them. Um, it, you know, will help be coming. And if help comes, who's going to be open? Um, Andre Drummond is not like, you know, he's not a key Olajuwon, but okay. if the help comes from him and the ball gets tossed in the air, he can, he can catch it and throw it down. Um, and that's, uh, you know, a pretty high percentage shot. Um, so yeah. Um, you know, is, can Bruce Brown hurt you? Yes, he can. Can Seth Curry hurt you? If Seth Curry gets in a roll, that spaces the floor. And that means that's huge for, for Durant and for Irving driving and just Durant being open. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot in play here. We'll look at Durant and, uh, and Kyrie's numbers and people will judge, you know, based on that, which is utterly foolish. You know, if, uh, if they're going to double Durant and he scores 12 points, but he has seven assists and another 10 hockey assists, then he'll have done his job and there's a good mm-hmm. chance the Nets will have succeeded. You know, the Celtics, oh, we, you, you, took, you held him down. And people will think that Durant didn't have a good game because they see 12 points, but he can dominate a game. I remember a billion years ago, um, the Celtics played the, the Suns. And I think I've got the exact the numbers right, but it was at the old uh, Veterans Coliseum in Phoenix. And uh, the, I remember Celtics were looking at the score sheet after I think it was McHale, another guy, uh, might have been Ainge, might have been. Uh, Parish or someone, they looked, held up this, the the uh, the stat sheet and said, and pointed to Kevin Johnson's line and said, "Have you ever seen a guy shoot three for seven and dominate a game?" <laughs> you know, um, it happens. I mean, remember, let's bring it back into the modern era, before the peach basket. Um, excuse me, after the peach basket, uh, two thousand eight, game six against the Lakers. You know, who dominated that game? It was Rajon Rondo. Right. You know, the, the Lakers never get into their offense, you know? Yeah. I mean, one of the things I'm worried about for the Celtics is I, I think they've gotten over this, but the extent to which they 
they love Kyrie and idealize Durant. I could see them kind of getting scared from the get-go and then making ill-advised decisions. So uh, to that end, I mean, yeah, you, if, if you show them a little too much respect, either overcompensating on defense or not enough, bad things can happen. So I hope the coaching staff kind of right. guides them to that sweet spot. The old line from around the Celtics in the 80s, and I think even before it started, was, you know, the, the red from Red Arback and others, if you're scared, get a dog. <laughs> um, hey, Steve, have you been watching that HBO show Winning Time? I have. Uh, yeah. any, any thoughts? This is a complete aside, but any thoughts on the show itself or how it's been received? There, Well, there are some parts that that are clearly incorrect or overblown, mm-hmm. but with some of the characters, there have been like some subtle parts in there that, that are really on point that I yeah. think people might dismiss because they think that they've made a cartoon character out of a certain character. Uh, but I can tell you like in, you know, in a couple of instances, oh, they got that part right. Um, <laughs> but the, the bombast that goes with it or the subtle way they might've dropped something in there. Um, you know, it's like, well, that was the real thing right there. And, and you can notice because it's, you know, the, we were talking about access before the NBA has changed so mm-hmm. much in just, you know, from a essentially kind of mom and pop in a lot of ways uh, earlier on, you know, we used to go to team practice Celtics practices at Hellenic college in Brookline. We'd walk in before practice, sit in the stands and watch practice. Right. At the Lakers, we go into the stands at the forum, sit in the stands and watch the Lakers practice and then talk to them afterwards. So we saw, you know, obviously you're not going to write that they're working on this play here with this. But I mean, um, you know, we got to see the the dynamics, The you know, you don't see the interpersonal dynamics that happen away from us in the dressing mm-hmm. room before we're allowed in. But you can see a lot of the stuff that happens right in front of you and how guys are reacting with each other. And you could tell, I mean, the one example I bring up a lot, and, you know, this isn't telling tales, but, um, you know, when, when Pat Riley's coaching the Celtics, coaching the Celtics, coaching the Lakers, <laughs> and he says, okay, let's move on. And Magic says, hey, no, guys, let's run that one again. If you're a coach and you've got Magic Johnson saying that, hey, let's run that one again, guys, you know, life is good for you as a coach. Um, so, you know, how things work, you realize there's a lot more to go in that goes into it than just, you know, coach says this X, this O run this play, do this, do that. Sure. A lot more goes into it. Yeah. I guess I'm going to bridge it to my next question, which is that reminds me of all the, again, I don't know if you're on Snapchat, but Jason Tatum is very consistently posting post game workouts on Snapchat. So maybe he knows that magic Johnson story. I don't know. Um, well, if you're not going to read my stuff, I'm not going to go on Snapchat. So take that. <laughs> That's not deal. fair, Steve. I read your stuff all the time. I just wrote 10 articles today. So I haven't gotten to it. Uh, Steve, this season seems like a pretty special season. Who knows how it ends, but um, how it began is very different than how the regular season ended. Can you think of a time by the way, the Celtics really in the NBA that you, you saw a team pull in a one eighty like this. Oh, um, offhand, you know, I, you know, you see it in basketball in a seven game series, pretty much always the more talented team is going to win. The better team will win. Mm -hmm. I was uh, talking with Cedric Maxwell in the last couple of weeks and we were talking about how the 84 championship was probably a little more special than some others because the Lakers probably had the better quote unquote uh, talent that, you know, so, but it, in basketball, it had, you know, pretty much you're going to be fairly well assured that, the, that out of you know, four out of seven, the, the, the better team will advance hockey. Okay. I think you'll find a thousand examples in hockey of a team getting hot. The, uh, the blues and what was it? 2000, not that long ago when they came back and, and beat the Bruins in, in game seven, but they were yeah. like awful. And then they turn it around. So, you know, baseball teams get on a roll. Um, I can't think of one. I'm sure there are great examples that I'm just not thinking of right now. No, I'm, I, we asked you because I couldn't. We couldn't think of yeah. any. I mean, the Heat recently had that turnaround. Um, 
I think in the late 2000s, the Rockets went on a tear, but I don't know about anything. I mean, they went from, yeah, maybe they will trade Jalen Brown to, is this the best team in the NBA? And we don't know how to qualify that. Um, That's the thing is that the Celtics, when you looked at them last season and the early part of this season, and you were saying, you know, okay, what's teams they had, the talent was there. People yeah. weren't criticizing them because they, they didn't have enough talent. They were criticizing because they were underperforming based on what they had. And, and yeah, you can screw it up. You know, um, I keep going back to 2018 when, uh, you know, they didn't have Kyrie at the end. They lost um, Gordon Hayward in game one. Mm -hmm. And they get to game seven of the conference finals at home against Cleveland. Yeah. And, you know, and Cleveland is almost begging to die because they know they're going to get their clocks cleaned by Golden State. And I've said this and written this a, a ton of times, uh, but I can also guarantee you uh, for sure that Golden State was much happier to face Cleveland than they were the Celtics. Sure. Trust me. Uh, and they screwed up the game. And it was because of some of the things we were talking about earlier this year, you know, hero ball. And it's not because I'll say this again. It was, it's not necessarily because guys were being jerks. It was because guys were saying, okay, you know, I've been a star all my life. Give me the ball. I'll go make a play for us. You yeah. know, they were wanting to take responsibility and accountability. Give me the ball. I'll go and, and do something. But that takes you out of your offense. That, you know, they shot themselves out of that game seven against Cleveland. And it was, you know, that was a, they, they, that was criminal the way they lost that game, the way they did it for themselves. Um, yeah. Cleveland was good. Yes. LeBron James, any team that has LeBron James, you know, you add, you know, a factor of five to them because of, of his presence on the floor, not only what he does for himself and what he can produce, but how he allows others to, to play more freely in his wake. Um, but yeah, so, you know, the, you can screw things up. The fact that this Celtics team, and it, it wasn't like Brad Stevens was telling them, was not telling them to, to do what they're doing now. Mm -hmm. And it's not like they didn't know that if they did it, the team would be more successful and individually they'd be more successful too. They just couldn't get themselves to do it on a consistent basis. I think that was the frustration, you know, that's really, if you look at the conference finals in the bubble, right? Didn't they kind of screw themselves up that way and in, in against Miami? Same kind of basketball. It's like, this is not good basketball. And one thing I'll give the Celtics team credit for is they haven't used the, uh, gone to the cliche of, you know, nobody believed in us this year. Mm -hmm. Well, the way they were playing, they didn't believe in themselves. Yeah. You know, they didn't trust themselves as a team and what they could become but because you know that once they started doing that you know uh and it's again not just for what they what they could become as a team but look at Jalen Brown and and look at especially Jason Tatum yeah. people are now talking about him and should he get MVP votes and stuff and it's not just because he's putting up you know great scoring numbers it's because of the uh the multi-dimensional player his improvements in other areas, he wasn't a bad passer before, but now that he's, you know, more into the motion. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, again, this is something I wrote often was that yes, you want the ball in Jason Tatum's hands as much as possible, but instead of out front where he's got to deal with the whole floor and, you know, a stocked floor in front of him, you want him cutting and getting in positions where he receives the ball and is in position to finish. Right. You know, um, Jason Tatum as a finisher is a ridiculously uh, dangerous player. Yeah, he's got that Kevin Durant. Doesn't really matter how good of defense you play. I, I have the, the shot to just put it right over you. I, but, I, but, then he's, but then he's moving and making play. And by the way, if we can throw this in here, because everyone's, we've talked about Rob Williams, we've talked about his defense. Um, Rob Williams has been uh, a very important bailout option for this team, hasn't he? Yep. Uh, when you drive They've to the bucket, as such. Yeah. When you drive to the bucket and the defense collapses on you, 
And if you see the big, the, the opponent's big man has been, is one of the guys coming at you, you know, if I throw this thing up by the rim, I got a guy that's going to catch it and finish. Like that's, you know, um, that's as a, like steering out of a skid as a driver on a snowy road. I mean, and like you said about Andre Drummond, it's also leads to a really high field goal percentage, which incidentally could be a problem for the Celtics, um, <coughs> depending on how uh, Tyson Horford stand up. Although I, I trust in them pretty well, good. They've thrown those, some of those, you know, Tyson's made some of those plays because he knows how to get in position. They yeah. just can't throw the ball as high to Daniel. No, not quite. I mean, I, I don't think there's a limit to how high you can throw it to Rob, as best I can tell. Um, well, there is a there, I, I, and what and it hits the it hits the cap, really block you know, the just <laughs> ruins banners, so that could be a problem. I'm not sure what the ground rules are in the garden for that, but yeah, well, maybe, maybe they'll find out. All right, Steve, we'll get you out of here with um, two predictions. First, uh, I would love for you to tell us how the Celtics Nets series is going to go, how many games, and uh, I guess who advances, and then depending on that answer, I have a follow up. If I give you a, a a number and stuff like that, then I'm just making stuff up. So, yeah, you know, I'm not going to, you know, I, I don't think that's. All right. Fantastic. Kind of I respect respect. But I just, look, the way I look at series is if each team plays to its capabilities, which team wins. I think if each team plays its best basketball, the Celtics win, um, you know, and, and if they're wise about it, it shouldn't take a long time, but you never know what can happen. There's a thousand things that um, I was when people are, are sports gamblers, mm -hmm. if they knew how many different things can impact upon their bet, they would never bet. No, you know? I, I didn't um, even play so, fantasy football for that reason. Yeah. Um, all right. Let me, anyway. let me pivot and give you a different final question. As a basketball fan, not a, not sitting here in the Boston area, just a basketball fan. What team in the Eastern conference are you excited to see reach their potential? Hmm. I, you know, I'm really excited to see um, what Milwaukee does, sure. in, you know, and for the for a second act, you know, um, I'm not a I grew up around here, but I'm not a Celtic fan. I'm not a fan. You know, the, sure. the basketball team I root for is the University of Dayton. Um, <laughs> OK, uh, but, um, you know, I do have a little bit of affinity for the Bucks. Um, not because Giannis and Tedekumpo is Greek, but because I'm Greek. Sure. Um, but uh, no, I, but in all seriousness, I really want to see how they handle what they went through. Um, mm -hmm. But there's a thousand other things I really want to see and know. I want to see how Miami does this. I want to see the Kyle Lowry factor for Miami because mm -hmm. I think that could be very large for them. Um, yeah, the... Um, how the chemistry works in Philadelphia with, um, with Embiid and Harden, um, what the Nets do, um, you know, Toronto is a, is a, a team that people should pay a little bit more attention to than they do. It's a mm -hmm. team who know, they know who they are and they've got guys that are going to ball out and make plays and, they're not going to be caught up in the, I have my, or, I haven't gotten my touches kind of thing. They just go out and play. Fred Van Vliet is a, is a guy I love watching play basketball. Um, so yeah, uh, so again, a weasel, really weaselly answer. No, it's, it's you an know. informed answer because this Eastern conference is amazing. Um, I, from a Celtics perspective, I'm so fearful of the Raptors zone defense. Um, but that's a problem for another series, perhaps. Um, Steve Pulpit from heavy.com. We can't thank you enough. Does Alexander, the other guys get to participate? You know, you guys. Yeah, but oh, we, you know, they, they relegated me to the bench for this one. I really <laughs> was. I, I in the self relegated. Uh, yeah. In the, in the previous podcast, I was really just ranting a lot. So uh, they, they decided that they needed to kind of keep me. In well, I got a question. Gentlemen. Where do you guys yeah. teach? Okay. Uh, I teach at Walnut Hill School for the Arts at Natick. Cool. And I'm at Lexington High School. I'm wearing a Lexington High School t-shirt, in fact. I actually have a Lexington uh, pullover that I got from speaking at the Rotary Club dinner the, when they played a Burlington a few couple of years ago, one of the last uh, Thanksgiving uh -huh. football games. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah. 
Hey, not bad. Um, yeah. Steve, I have one more question actually for you before we uh, break out, and I, I totally blanked on it, but um, you mentioned wings before. Drums or flats? You know, I thought about that question endlessly. It's it's kept me awake at night, mm-hmm. and it, it's like, which one of your kids is your favorite? <laughs> All right, you know, I appreciate I, I, that. When I'm sitting there and I when I make the wing, I get like a, a thing of ten wings usually, and there are five flats and five drums and you know you're you i'll go through them as i'm watching the game you know, I'm, I'm through the wings there uh and you always want to save like the one for last right yeah and, like it's the hardest thing which one do i save for last i'm looking at this this flat looks good this wing looks pretty big i don't know it's tough seems like it's a situational kind of thing yeah because you know? it depends on how much sauce is attached to each one it's it's really <laughs> That just said, I like right now I'm not using sauce. I'm just doing the seasoning, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, so it's a dry rub. Yeah. Well, it's the, you know, the Cajun seasoning and the, and the Montreal. I mean, are you guys barbecue people? Like, you know, Forsberg and I, we've eaten barbecue around the, around the league. My favorite is still, uh, you know, rendezvous in, in Memphis. It's a dry rub. With oh yeah. Finish. Uh, Alex grew up in Tennessee. So you're speaking his language. Yes, sir. <laughs> you a rendezvous person. Well, I've been to Memphis and I've had the barbecue there. I don't remember if it was rendezvous specifically, but yeah. I, I do have a very high opinion of Memphis barbecue. Yeah. Oh, no. It's, and, but there's other ones that are like, you know, that are talked about a lot. But um, yeah, rendezvous is, uh, you know, again, dry rub. And they, they give you sauce if you want to, you know, put some on it, whatever. But it's just, uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, Dallas, Sonny Brian's barbecue. Uh, so uh, I'll talk to you guys when the, on the next uh, barbecue podcast. Yeah, this Excellent. off season we'll do more. <laughs> we'll discuss barbecue the game and uh, R and B music and uh, oh you know, god, and Dude, then I can actually talk that. about something that I know. <laughs> barbecue and you know. Well, you had us just a little bit. my way through this basketball stuff. Obviously, <laughs> it's convincing. I'll tell you that much. Uh, Steve, we can't thank you enough. This was a huge honor, a lot of fun, and um, yeah, you're welcome back anytime to talk about. Whatever you want to talk about, barbecue, wings, R&B, hoops, you name it. Guys, good to speak with you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks very much, Steve. Chowder.